and then you're gonna get like a little rock, a little nugget in your bread. And then if you see one, you know that you, just, you know like, if you have, when you're doing your mixer, you can slowly add it as it's mixing. But you don't wanna just kind of add it all together because then you're gonna get little rock hard chunks of dough in your stuff, okay? And then you're gonna slowly add in your flour. So for this size batch, it's a thousand grams of flour. I do not have wheat flour. You're gonna notice in your directions that there's wheat flour. It adds a lot of flavor and a little bit more of a more like rustic uh, uh, tinge to it. So I just don't use it because I just don't have it. And I don't use enough of it to warrant buying 50 pounds. So uh, you can get one at like Trader Joe's or whatever, those little those little ones of, you know, you can add rye flour, whole wheat flour, these, all these things add different textures and flavors to your dough. So once you get your basic um, country bread dough down, you've made it a couple of times, that's when it's time to try and find other things to put into it, like olives and fresh herbs from your garden and all those kinds of things are really nice additions to, to a, a good sourdough. Okay, so we're just gonna add in our flour, thousand grams. I use uh, spelt wheat uh, bread flour from uh, uh, King Arthur. Can't really buy this one. It's like a commercial, like specialty bread flour, but their regular in the blue bag bread flour is my go-to. It's my favorite. They, out of all the American companies that produce flour, they are the only ones that really follow the rules. They still go by the standards of European flour, so we can't find. Uh, can't find the bread flour, um, then I would go to um, like Paisano's or something like that. That's going to have. Uh, there's also another one. Uh, you want to go to a specialty place like this uh, so that you can get the European flour. The European flour is better because they have very strict rules as far as chemicals and uh, things of that nature. Like the things that go into our wheat here in the United States is terrible. And that's why we have so many gluten allergies. We have so many problems with it. My personal belief, I'm not a scientist, but I've been making bread for a really long time. And this bread will last three days outside of the refrigerator. And that's natural. That's what's supposed to happen. It'll start molding. Things will start going wrong with the bread. That bread you buy from the grocery store sits on above your refrigerator for two weeks before it even starts to feel stale. There is nothing right about that. Absolutely nothing. So is that an heirloom flour that you have? No, heirloom flowers were going to be like more of a whole wheat kind of a flower. These, this is spet or split, uh, so it just doesn't go through the same bleaching process. So it's a lot less bleach. So once you've incorporated your dough, I'm doing it by hand, so I'm adding an extra step, which is uh, you do another 20 ounces of water after everything is fine, and that way your uh, that way your salt is properly like tied into everything. Okay, so this is the first stage. And when you're done with this, you don't necessarily want to fold it or do anything to it. You're just gonna get everything incorporated and let the dough do what it does. And this is the first step is what was referred to as an auto lease. So now you're now that you've started to work with the dough and you created gluten, now you need before you go on to your next step, you need to um, you let your gluten rest in the dough. So it doesn't look pretty. It's very like loose. It's not gonna look like a finished product yet. But after about 25 minutes, or sorry, after about your, about an hour at room temperature, you're going to see it start to get a little bit fluffy. You'll see little bubbles start to form and that's when you're gonna do your first bowl. And I will do that with you right here. Give me one second to wash my hands. Don't worry about me, you can get in the way. Alright, so after about an hour, it should look something like this. Okay, so this hasn't been folded yet. You still see that it's very like not smooth, but you see once once I fold it, okay, you start to see.
the probably you just fold it in the container but so that you guys can see it a little bit better so I'm using the weight of the dough okay do you see it starting to get smoother as I'm lifting it and you see that as I'm doing this it's getting tighter okay so there's many ways to fold this is my favorite way because it's so easy yes ma'am what the yeast was in uh was in the uh It was a natural yeast. It's, it, it was carved like mixed in with the with the water. Okay. So now that it's not, see that you have some bubbles starting to form on top. It's got a little bit of pliability to it. The most important part about dough, and this is the hardest part to teach, is there's so many variables that go into it. You can't just go off of time and temperature. You need to like look at the dough, and and this is the re biggest reason why I'm doing this, so that you guys can see the different stages, what it's supposed to feel like because it's a connection between you and the bread. You can't just, you can't just wing it. You have to like, you have to pay attention to all the different signs that the bread is telling you. Okay, so now it goes right back into here. All right, and then a nice container like this that's gonna hold in heat. So these Cambros you can actually get from like a restaurant supply store, they're like less than $20. And the plastic that they're made out of is completely dishwasher safe, reusable, and it's also going to hold in the temperature of the dough. So inside of this container, if you leave it, we live in Florida, so if you want to speed things up, you can like set it outside for 10, 15 minutes so this feels warm to the touch, and it'll, it'll act like a proofing box. So that'll give you that nice fluffy dough that you're looking for. Let me uh, pull the next uh, batch out from the back. I'll be right back. Some people choose 
to use a spray bottle and they just spray it lightly um, and, and a little bit on your hands and they use that. So it's either water or flour. I have some double zero flour, which is my favorite. Um, and then you're just gonna kind of keep on doing this until you see it tighten up. And then you're gonna, I use the inside of my palm and you're gonna drag it across the board and you're gonna pull, pull around and you're gonna pull back. And that's, and you're gonna see your dough start to tighten as you're doing that. And you're gonna do it until you feel your dough is holding in shape. So you see how it's still pliable. You see a little bit of, uh, if you get too many big bubbles on top, you can give them a little pop, or else you're gonna get uh, little bu like little bubbles on the outside of your dough. It's not that big of a deal, it's kind of a natural thing. Um, and then this is going to sit for another 30 minutes to 40 minutes until, just until it kind of like loses its, its, its elasticity. And then you're gonna do it one more, the same process one more time and you'll notice that it has a lot more like bounce to it. It's gonna be a lot fluffier, okay? And at that point, I use rice flour. Some people use an old cut up t-shirt. You can use, don't use a kitchen towel that has fuzz on it, okay? There's also like very specific uh, like companies that you can go buy the really nice baskets and all that stuff, but there's a lot of upkeep and, and whatnot. And because Florida is so humid, you're not supposed to wash those baskets. Um, you just kind of like naturally, you know, like you, you're building flavor in the basket as well. So here in Florida, it has a tendency to mold too fast. So I like to use a metal bowl and rice flour. Rice flour absorbs a ridiculous amount of moisture. So your, when you get your, your dough into here, it, you want the nipple side up, okay? And then one more little dusting around the side, okay? And that's gonna keep this from sticking to the bowl. So when you go to plop it out, it plops out really nice. This is gonna bake off just like regular flour. It's not gonna change the texture or flavor of your dough at all, okay? And then I do a 24 hour or you know 12 hour rest in the refrigerator. You get a much better, uh, you can make much better designs in the dough because it's nice and hard. And you get a much better rise out of the dough because that ice cold to super hot causes a very rapid rise. And that's what you want. And you'll see it in these doughs right here. Okay. So when you get that nice rapid rise, you get a nice tall loaf, and you can smell that nice sour, crusty feeling on the outside. Um, if you do not have a Dutch oven or a cast iron at home, you really need to buy one to do this. Uh, I, uh, Target actually has Dutch ovens on sale right now. I just personally bought one because every time they go on sale somewhere, I have like, 30 of them, they're all different shapes and sizes because you never know when you're gonna need another one. Um, but also Facebook Marketplace, there's always someone getting rid of cast iron stuff. Uh, but it's definitely, I consider that a necessity because you can do a baking stone and try and accomplish this, but you're not gonna get this. You know what I'm saying? It's not gonna come out this way. You need the steam from the lid being closed, like in your, in your oven at home, you can use a steam, uh, like like a, a like a baking pan with some water in it, or ice. A lot of people will just take a hot baking pan, throw ice on the hot baking pan right before it goes in the oven. But most ovens that you're gonna have at your house are just not gonna be sealed properly, like a, a commercial oven. So to get that really awesome crust the flavor, like the flavor, a lot of it comes from the crust. Okay, so that's that when you're biting into it, you get the soft sour from the inside and you get that harder, crunchier, saltier sour from the outside. So that's what kind of creates that whole interesting flavor profile from the sourdough. Uh, and right here in just a second, I'm gonna go back there and I'm gonna show you how to score the dough before it goes into the cast iron. Okay, give me one second. You wanna move right here and then I take it? What? Yeah. So, uh, the industry referred to this as monkey dust, or knuckle dust, I mean. So, it's semolina flour, and this is just like when you eat pizza and you get it and it's got that weird grainy stuff at the bottom. That's what this is. 
Okay, so what it is is it creates like an invisible little barrier between those scorching hot cast iron and your dough. So you get all the benefits of having a hot cast iron, and when you do put this on the bottom, that keeps it from actually touching. So that's why pizza doesn't burn when it goes into a 700 degree pizza oven, because it's not physically touching the heat. It's kind of almost like rolling over the top with the with these little, they're very like hard, they don't burn very, when you put them in the hot cast iron, they're gonna smoke a little bit. Don't worry about that. That's not that big of a deal. You're gonna to wanna to get your, I know this is, I'm adding on things to buy, but um, you can get them at, uh, at a, any hardwood store. Um, it's a little laser heat, like laser detector heat, heat detector. So you want the inside of your cast iron to be a specific temperature, somewhere yeah, between 420 and 450, okay? It's really hard to get into that temperature in a regular oven, so you're gonna need to leave your cast iron in the oven for a solid 25 minutes, okay? After it's already gotten to the temp, you know, after it's already gotten to a temperature. The cast iron yes, oven would be an enamel building. Cast iron, oh, you mean like the Dutch oven? The Dutch oven. I use parchment paper. So you're gonna wanna do this, so what you'll do is you'll lay out a piece of parchment paper, and then you'll lay your dough out on the piece of parchment paper, score, which I can kind of do for you right here. But not at the sides, just on the bottom. I'm sorry? Not, on, not the parchment paper go up the sides, just on the bottom. No, 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 yeah, just, so what I, what you normally do is you take your bowl itself mm -hmm. and you use that, cut a, little, cut a little circle, maybe leave yourself like a little half an inch, and then make little tiny cuts, just the little tiny ones, so that when it sits into the cast iron, it'll kind of fold up the sides instead of like just crunching on the outside. Okay, so this is one that's been in the refrigerator overnight that I made yesterday. Um, and, that's why, and that's why I like that cold. And it also gives you the uh, ability to have like fresh bread in the morning. So if you do it the night before, pop it in the, the refrigerator, everybody's still asleep, you get the bacon going, you pop this out of the oven as soon as you take that cast iron off every single person in your family is going to be fighting to get down those stairs to get into the bacon and the and the fresh bread okay so you have a nice hot cast iron over here um some people use some people use uh, a razor blade i find that i lose them all the time here in the production kitchen but at home if you have a nice drawer with your razor blade that works. I use scissors, okay? Uh, it works really well for like nice, even, especially when you're just starting out, that's all you need to do and into the oven and you're done. A lot of times if you don't flour this properly and the blade is not perfectly sharp, it gets stuck in your dough and then you end up with weird tears and stuff like that. Just over the years, I've just, it's easier. Um, so this gets dusted here and gets dusted one more time before it goes into the cast iron. Okay, and then pinch the dough. So you have a nice, okay. Can you find the Sorry? All right, and then you're gonna do the same thing. If you happen to have a nice little uh, clean water bottle that doesn't have anything else in it, a little, one or two sprays of water on the inside, not on the dough, on the inside on the edge, okay? Uh, we'll, we'll add a little bit of moisture and give you, so the more moisture you have, the, the longer it's gonna take for the bread to seal. So that's what gives it that ability to rise as much as it does, is the fact that it's wet still. So it's still pushing as the bread is pushing and cooking on the side, it's pushing up, pushing up. And then it finally gets to the point where this is dry enough that it seals up. And that's how you get those really nice flaky pieces on the top. Okay. Is there, uh, and that's pretty much how it's done. Is there any other questions?